Thanks so much to everyone for joining us today. Hello and welcome to the Missouri Botanical Garden. I'm uh, the person who's speaking is Neshka Pfeiffer. I'm not on your screen. I'm having a little video glitch today, um, but I'm the Sachs Museum curator here at the garden and your host and moderator for the 10 part series, Bioculture, Plants and People Interacting, which has been organized by the William L. Brown Center and made possible by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Each of the 10 talks in this series will explore the ways that plants and people interact through the lens of the Missouri Botanical Garden's biocultural collection. The objects in this collection, which range from simple carved wooden spoons to complex herbal compounds, are tangible evidence of the ways that plants and people interact. They're a valuable resource for understanding humanity's biocultural heritage and for the conservation of nature itself. They're also a means of preserving traditional knowledge, documenting livelihoods, and showing the lasting influence of ethnobotany on the diversity of human cultures. The presentation today will last approximately 30 minutes with a 20 minute presentation and time at the end for Q&A. Throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the Q&A function in the box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll sort through your questions and get to as many of them as possible at the end of the presentation. Today's program will be recorded and posted on the Missouri Botanical Gardens YouTube channel in the coming weeks. We're able to offer accessibility features, including ASL interpretation and live captioning, which you can access via the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. To turn that off or for more options, just click on that closed captioning feature. We respectfully acknowledge that we host this event from the tra traditional ancestral lands of the Osage Nation, which was historically home to many diverse Native peoples who continue to live and work here. Particularly when speaking about the interactions of plants and people, we want to honor and express gratitude to the Indigenous and local people whose wisdom and innovations have shaped and continue to shape the ways in which we engage with the natural world. I'm going to ask Dr. Robbie Hart, director of the William L. Brown Center of the Missouri Botanical Garden to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Nishka. The William L. Brown Center at the Missouri Botanical Garden is dedicated to the study of useful plants, understanding the relationships between humans, plants, and their environment, the conservation of plant species, and the preservation of traditional knowledge for the benefit of future generations. So each of the talks in this series resonates with this mission, but it makes me especially proud today to introduce James Ojas Castro, who in his role as a graduate student at the William L. Brown Center is advancing us towards these goals of understanding species conservation and knowledge preservation. James is a papermaker, origami artist, and a PhD candidate in biology at Washington University in St. Louis. James's dissertation research uses ecological, anthropological, statistical, and artistic techniques to understand the rationales of plant choice in hand papermaking traditions around the globe. James has really been a catalyst in pushing collaboration among different disciplines, different departments, and different institutions in St. Louis, and uh, in connecting communities of paper scholars, paper artists, and artisans around the world. Additionally, James is one of the biocultural curation interns funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities grant that also makes this series possible. James, thank you much for, so much for speaking us, to us today. Uh, thanks, Nezhka and Ravi, for those wonderful introductions, and thanks to all of you for attending today. Uh, I'm going to jump right in and uh, start with saying that paper is a very ubiquitous plant product. Um, we use it in everyday life, from politics, from literature. Uh, we use it to shape wood, for drawing, for taking notes, for packaging, uh, even for wearing, as you can see in the, the example of a shirt from made from bark cloth uh, in the lower right. We use it for commerce through paper money. Uh, we use it for construction through the shoji screens that are used in Japan uh, on the wall paneling there. And we even use it for hygiene. Um, but let's start with some definitions. Um, so paper is just a flat, 
thin material made from felted plant fiber, felting meaning the random tangling of the fibers rather than organized weaving uh, as you see in many kinds of cloth. The reason that they are made from plant fibers um, is that plants, uh, regardless of their size, are chiefly composed of cellulose fiber from the largest trees down to the smallest herbs. You can think about this using Legos. So Legos are composed of small bricks. And in the same way, plants are composed of fibers made out of cellulose. Um, each fiber um, is composed of these tangled threads of molecules that all form a linear structure and are bound together through something called hydrogen bonding. You can see these fibers um, very easily in many kinds of plants. Um, as you can see here, you can see those linear or parallel bands that are, are seen in many of these insets shown on this slide. Um, in most kinds of papermaking today, however, we end up using the wood. Wood has traditionally been very inaccessible uh, to most papermakers due to the content of a chemical called lignin. But through the use of strong acids, we were able to make wood into paper by machine. And that is typically what is done today. But what I'm gonna focus on is paper being made through traditional methods entirely by hand. And although these images were taken about 50, 50 years ago in Nepal, many people in Nepal and other parts of the world still make paper by hand today using these tools. I will talk shortly uh, about many of these tools that are used here um, later in this presentation. So here is an array of many different kinds of plants that have been used and are currently used in traditional hand paper making. How do we decide that we use certain kinds of plants over others? There's over 400,000 species of plants, but only a select few, or only around 3,000, are used for fiber, and only a few dozen have been used in traditional paper making. One hint that we can get is by looking at the anatomy and by processing the plant slightly. Um, one group of plants has this particular and interesting character where if you strip the bark, you can remove the bark in one strong and complete strip from the wood. And this actually constitutes a group of related plants in the family Thymeliaceae. The Thymeliaceae is a family of about 900 species um, it is found in tropical and warm temperate parts of the world and includes species that are used for paper in Japan, Nepal, and as we can see, also in Vietnam. In Vietnam, the central species that is used, although not the exclusive one, is this tree called Zha. It looks like Do, but in Vietnamese, this is pronounced Zha. This is a species Ramnoneurin balancy, and it is found in South China, as well as Northern Vietnam. The bark of the zaw tree is used to make this very soft, but also very strong and durable paper called zaw as well. And this is a, a kind of paper that can last for hundreds of years. And there are examples that date from about 1400 CE. To make this kind of paper, we need a special tool um, called a paper making mold. And a mold is composed of a porous surface, so that is the material that is in the center of this, this uh, accession, and also a frame which holds the screen in place. If you were to take apart the mold, you can see that there are two different name pieces, but really three pieces, and this differs from what we see in places like Japan, and I'll get into that. The bamboo screen, which is porous and allows the water to fall through, but not the fiber, uh, is called the liam sao, and the sao is the way that uh, the Vietnamese describe their papermaking technique. So all the tools that are associated with this kind of papermaking technique are usually named sao. The thing that holds the liam sao in place is the hung sao, which is a wooden frame, and this is composed of two parts. In Japan, this frame is typically formed as a clamshell where the uh, bamboo screen is pinned in place. But in Vietnam, these form two pieces. 
The bottom piece, which you can see on the lower right, um, has these slats which, which support the bamboo screen. And then on top, a separate piece, which has the shape of a U, and then a spacer bar, which holds the left and right sides um, to the right um, dimension so that they don't buckle. Um, here I'm going to show some videos that show the entire paper making process. It all starts by stripping the bark of the zaw tree. You can use a knife and as I said before with the thymeliaceae, you are able to strip and remove the fibrous bark as one long and continuous band. The bark is then dried and shipped to paper makers outside of the capital Hanoi and re-soaked in water to rehydrate it. And then you remove any undesirable external bark from the fibers that are desirable. You can then cook those fibers um, in an alkaline solution. So what is used here is, I believe, lye. And you cook that for several hours. And then once you drain the liquid, you can um, beat the fibers using mallets. Here you can see a gentleman who is shaving a tree called ma. And the ma tree produces a mucilage, which aids in the dispersion of the fibers on the screen. You can see that the solution has a different kind of uh, consistency. It's, it's a little bit thicker and the water drains uh, less readily or more slowly. So here's the bat, this is called the beseo. And the paper maker is dispersing the fibers evenly throughout the water in the basin. And now she uses the kung seo and lim seo, dips it into the, the, the vat. And you can see very quickly that a very thin sheet of paper is deposited on the bamboo screen. She then transfers that wet paper onto a stack or what we call a post in paper making and repeats the process hundreds of times to obtain a tall stack of, of wet paper. Then you take the post, the stack of wet paper, and you have to press it to expe expel the excess water. After you expel the excess water, you can then peel off sheet by sheet each sheet of paper. And then you deposit any stray fibers back onto the sheet using a soft brush. And then to fully dry the sheets, you paste them on the wall. And houses in Vietnam are typically made of concrete and are porous and can help wick away the water from these sheets that are pasted one by one on the wall. To accelerate the drying, you can use an army of floor fans and aim them on the walls to uh, assist in the wicking away of water. Then you can sh uh, scrape away these short stacks of Zaw paper um, and then peel them apart and then sell them for whatever the paper will be used for next. One of the things that uh, Zaw paper has been used for traditionally are these woodblock prints called Dongho paintings. Um, these are uh, native to a village just northeast of Hanoi and very nearby where um, paper is made in. Vietnam. And so these are paintings that are typically used and gifted, especially around the Lunar New Year uh, in Vietnam called Tet, um, usually to bring good fortune or to celebrate auspicious events. So now I'm going to show you a second video that shows how these woodblock prints are made. So carvers will carve from um, diaspirus or persimmon wood.
And each block represents a particular color. And these colors are stacked upon each other using their specific um, wood blocks and overlaid to form an image in full color. All these dyes are obtained through either vegetable or mineral means. So for example, um, the black color is obtained through soot. And one thing I should mention before I go on is that the paper, the Zaw paper is in fact treated with a special mixture to allow the ink to bind properly to the paper and also to make the colors uh, more accentuated. This mixture is a pearlescent mixture. It's made from crust, uh, crushed seashells that are mixed with fermented uh, glutinous rice. Um, that is painted on the paper before printing um, and gives a very uh, appealing texture to the paper. Now, um, unfortunately, these traditions are very endangered um, and there are many threats. So we see uh, overall in many places around the world, not just Vietnam, the substitution of machine made paper for handmade paper. Um, this leads to the loss of traditional uses of handmade paper. Um, the paper makers are not incentivized con to continue their practice because they cannot make any money. And so as a result, younger generations are less likely to learn uh, artisanal trades that date back generations. So examples of this decline, if I wanted to put numbers at them, um, I'm gonna show three different villages where paper making has been practiced traditionally in Vietnam. In just about 40 years, you can go from 5,000 people, the entire village um, participating in paper making to just 15 today. In another village, uh, this decline over just 10 years went from 70 families to just five. And then I don't have uh, numbers over time for this village, but in 2019, only three people were still making paper by hand. Um, an example of this decline can be also illustrated through this other accession. So, Zaw paper, um, the lower quality grades, you can see that there are these flecks in, in this sheet. Um, votive paper is paper that is burned as an offering in rituals or venerations. So I met a general uh, gentleman named uh, Chu Van Tan, who used to make paper in his village west of Hanoi. And what this paper was used for is that um, it was made using the smaller frame and then it was cut into smaller rectangles, which they called money, and they were incised using a wooden stamp. And these were burned uh, during auspicious occasions or during the Lunar New Year. But over that time, cheaper paper has been uh, accessible, made from wood pulp and printed um, from places like China and imported into Vietnam. And so we see this displacement of traditional votive paper that was made by hand by machine made paper that was printed to form icons of wealth like tuxedos, and houses, and cars. One way that we can counteract this kind of decline is actually to introduce co-optation. So uh, young artists like Nguyen Hung Kung who have rediscovered uh, Vietnamese paper um, have co-opted it to new traditions that have not been traditionally associated with Vietnamese paper making. And Kung is an origami artist and origami uh, flourished in Japan but has since spread around the world. And he was able to tailor the Zal paper for folding exquisite origami like this gorilla and this shark. And so innovations by Kung and other origami artists in Vietnam origami group have led to the spread and usage of Zaw paper around the world, uh, including these examples shown here. So um, I want to conclude today with the point that um, effective ethnobotanical conservation must be adaptive, innovative, and culturally sensitive to be robust against rapid global change. This way, if one usage is extinguished or displaced, a new usage 
can help ensure that these key human plant relationships can continue. So uh, I wanna thank you for joining me uh, on this walk along the paper trail. And I wanna thank uh, the Missouri Botanical Garden, uh, Washington University in St. Louis, the Zoll Project, Origami Vietnam, and the National Endowment for the Humanities to make this work and this lecture po possible. Um, and with that, I can take any questions. Thank you. James, thank you so much. Um, before we start the q and I just want to encourage everyone to please take a moment to fill out our survey, which I've dropped in the chat box. Um, and I'll drop links for the next talk, which will be on March 16th by the garden's own president, Dr. Peter Weiss Jackson, uh, which is called Brown Gold for a Developing Irish Nation, Peat, an Important Plant-Derived Resource. So we hope to see you at that one as well. Um, and James, please feel free to go back to your uh, previous slide. It's got your, you know, your socials on it and stuff, because uh, I know I enjoy uh, following you on Instagram and Twitter when you're posting your great research about um, your paper making and your origami. Um, I do want to ask the first question that Robbie's got. Are there ways that we as consumers in the United States can support traditional paper makers in Vietnam or elsewhere where similar craft traditions survive? Uh, yes, absolutely. There's many organizations around the world that help trying to make, um, they share these traditions, which are typically endemic to particular villages or small regions within countries where traditional paper making is practiced. And they make these sheets accessible. Um, one that I work with is called ZO Project, Z -O Project. Um, and um, the founder, uh, Chen Hong Nyung, has been very instrumental in ensuring that um, research and scholarship and arts associated with Vietnamese papermaking uh, are documented now to help uh, to help bolster against any further loss and to in fact um, ensure a revival of this art as well as adoption of new uses um, for these uh, papermaking traditions. Um, the importance of that is not that the new uses displace the old traditions, but that they can be done in tandem and complement each other, such that these artisans can continue to practice um, paper making. And um, Susie has a question which uh, is, a, is a little bit, goes a little bit further deeper perhaps in what you were just describing it, is how widespread is the craft of paper making in Vietnam? Are there any machine production factories and are there any fibers used to manufacture paper? any other fibers, sorry, used to manufacture paper? Yes, uh, Vietnam is surprisingly diverse um, in the, the kinds of fibers that have been used. Um, paper mulberry, which is used throughout Southeast Asia, is also used and processed in Vietnam. Um, for example, here I am making a couching a sheet of, of uh, paper mulberry uh, fiber onto this post. Um, so that is still practiced today. There's two other species that are done in two other parts of Northern Vietnam. And certainly there may be others that are, are uh, also incorporated. Um, some ethnic groups in Northern Vietnam also use bamboo um, and those are used for burning or decoration uh, as well. Um, there are also different kinds of methods for making paper. Um, I alluded to this in the villages example here. And so on the right and in the middle, you can see that a different kind of mold is used to deposit fiber into a sheet and drain them, uh, drain the water from it. Um, and so here, individual uh, molds are used rather than the sheets being peeled off and deposited into a stack. Um, and I'm, I'm going to combine two questions here from Mindy and from uh, Boris. Um, does removing the bark kill the tree? And how do they ensure sustainable use of plants for paper making? Yes, there's two different ways that um, people who have used these plants can approach this. In the West um, and in uh, West Asia as well, a lot of the species that have been used for fiber are herbaceous. So they tend to be... Um, harvested and then killed, but then their seed is saved and planted for the next season. So we see this with plants like flax, um, cotton, as well as um, uh, hemp. 
In East Asia, uh, typically what is done is that the branches of the plant are coppiced or cut off, but these individual uh, species have abilities where they can regenerate following that uh, coppicing. And this allows people to use the same plants uh, over and over again if you give them enough time to regrow. Um, and in these cases, uh, typically um, the span of time uh, between uh, harvest, uh, harvest time is on the order of, you know, maybe two, three, four, five years, depending on the species and how fast they grow. Great. Um, I've had a couple questions come in that talks about, uh, that asks um, both, uh, are there analogous uh, paper making traditions in the Americas and are there groups of people that are making handmade paper in the U.S. as well today? Yes, that is a, a great question. Um, a lot of uh, paper makers are active in the U.S., um, both that follow the Western tradition of making sheets as well as the Eastern tradition. Um, but I want to point to the, the tradition of making amate in Mexico. Um, there are some people who may consider this not paper because what they do is they take the bark of different fig trees and they beat them with mallets into a, a sheet without the use of a vat filled with water. Um, but they function exactly like paper and there are famous codices that are 500 years old that escaped the Spanish conquest and destruction that still exist that document life um, uh, by the Aztecs and the Mayans. Um, and so this is a tradition that in fact is still practiced by um, one ethnic group in Mexico uh, called the Otomi. And um, although that they used fiber from figs traditionally, um, the popularity of this kind of paper uh, has exceeded supply and figs are no longer available in their region of Puebla in Mexico. And so now they've tr uh, transited to using uh, and experimenting with other species like one that is called metal tree or trema. Great, thank you. And I have um, a couple of questions in relation to um, the paper themselves, like uh, what kind of sizing do they use uh, for the paper? And Emily had a great question, which is also like, when, when you put the paper in these stacks, what keeps the sheets from sticking together? Yeah, those are also great questions. Um, sizing, I haven't seen been used for many um, paper making traditions, uh, especially the ones that are in more remote villages. Um, so sizing is kind of like a, a, a way of treating the surface of the paper to make it more amenable to certain qualities, whether you make it uh, stronger or you make a, a flatter sheet or you want to make something that uh, absorbs um, uh, humidity or moisture or, or ink better. Um, sizing is used in origami to treat uh, paper because, uh, for example, zaw paper is, is uh, not sized straight from, from the place that is made. And so to make it more crisp, um, the Vietnamese origami artists will apply a layer of PVA. This is just your standard white glue. Um, other origami artists to make it crisp um, and hold its shape better uh, will use a chemical called methyl cellulose. And these essentially just are like starching the paper much as you would starch collars or clothes. Um, um, people used to do that a long time ago. Um, so as far as how do the papers not stick to each other in the post, um, the cool thing is that the action of the paper maker, um, when they dip the frame into the vat, um, allows the fibers to interlock with each other within the sheet more strongly than between sheets. And so in that way, by uh, sheet formation, you can ensure that the tangling of the fibers within the sheet um, is strong enough that as you separate the sheets, um, they will separate rather cleanly and not destroy the paper as you as you peel sheet by sheet um, the sheets off each other. Okay, great, thank you. And I just want to warn everyone: uh, we, we're technically at time, but we have so many amazing questions. If everybody wants to stick with us, uh, and James, and this is okay with you, we can uh, go through them all because um, there's some really great content here. Um, uh, that I think a lot of people would want to also know the answers to these. Uh, Carolina has a great question. Thanks you for your wonderful talk and is wondering what role do women play in this traditional paper making? Yeah, um, 
That's a great question. Um, I have seen, I, I don't wanna generalize village by village, but for the two villages that I have really solid uh, and intimate knowledge about, um, the women are important in the sheet formation and the men have typically done the more um, rough labor of harvesting and hauling the trees. But um, at least today, there is a great amount of, um, I guess, dual participation by different genders in Vietnam. Um, I think that's extremely cool. Um, the other example in Northeastern Vietnam with only three people who still practice tradition, the chief uh, papermaker among them is a man and he intends, he, ha he has one son and he intends to pass it on to him. Um, but there's a point where the sample size and the, the, the more abundant nature of many of these traditions have made it difficult to find um, people to pass on this knowledge to. And so, um, man or woman, whoever you can get, um, you know, is, is important to, to, to carry on this legacy. Great. A um, couple of other questions I'm going to kind of combine here. Um, what qualities are important for paper used in origami? And is there a chance for Amate to become origami friendly? Um, I did a survey uh, two or three years ago, and it seems that many people who do really complex origami um, desire qualities where the paper is, is thin, but also able to resist um, repeated folding without breaking or failing. Um, and this is particularly important. Um, they also want the, the paper to be crisp so that if you make a fold, it doesn't unravel with each other. And um, one way of, of tailoring uh, or modifying the quality of the sheet is by sizing it um, with something like methyl cellulose or, or polyvinyl acetate. Um, amate, amate as traditionally used in, and made in Mexico is, is thicker than many of the sheets that are made in uh, Eastern traditions like what is done in Vietnam. Um, and so it is, it can be difficult to work with if you're an origami artist. Um, however, I think it would be very interesting to see if um, maybe co-opting the fibers that are used traditionally in Mexico, but then using a tradition different than uh, the pounding mechanism that is used in Mexico, um, and instead using something like what is done in, in China, Vietnam, and Japan to make a thinner sheet where the, the fibers are fully um, intertangled with each other. Um, that could yield some interesting results um, for not just for origami, but for um, other paper artists. That's great. Um, uh, one other uh, thing in relation to Jack asked, does this only happen in the former North Vietnam? As far as I know, yes. Um, I have, I, I don't want to say that paper is not made in Southern Vietnam. I sim simply have found no evidence of that. I know that in Southern Vietnam, the origami artists there typically use Thai mulberry um, because that's what's accessible, but it, it's not made in Southern Vietnam. Um, and I have seen examples of bark cloth from Southern Vietnam made from Antieris, which is a member of the Meraceae related to paper mulberry. Um, but it, despite the existence of bark cloth, I've never seen examples that bark cloth has been used um, explicitly for writing or as we would use for paper. Great. Um, Zachary asks, how has the renewal of use for origami affected plant sourcing and has a knowledge of certain plant cultivation been rediscovered? Um, I find origami to be a really cool nexus for finding like connections between different disciplines. Um, there are people who have connected mathematics with origami. That's been very apparent just through the geometry of the structure of how you orient your folds on a square or rectangle or whatever shape that you're using. Um, another way is through this kind of ethnobotany where it's not just the way that the sheets are formed by the paper maker, but the traits of the plants themselves come through in the paper that you choose to fold with. Um, and so being able to learn and access and adopt um, fibers that 
have been used for one particular use um, and co-opting that for origami through innovations by Kung and Vietnam Origami Group has allowed us to really get a sense of how do these different plants play into the way that origami uh, artists understand the way that the paper folds and the personalities of each sheet uh, species by species. Um, Ashley asks, paper seems to be so important for so many uses. Have you come across any groups or regions that don't have a paper making tradition? Yes. Um, and that makes it kind of difficult to generalize. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately is the case of the Philippines. Um, the Philippines has a uh, many different uh, kinds of plants that are used for fiber. Um, one example is salago, which is related to a species called gumpy, used for paper in Japan. And today, salago is sold to paper makers around the world, as is another uh, native species called abaca, which is related to banana. Um, despite all these useful fiber plants coming from the Philippines, we have no as of yet good evidence that the Philippines have had traditions of making paper. Um, and this strikes me as being weird, not just by the, the, the fact that we have um, suitable fiber plants that are demonstrably good for making paper, but also um, there have been different kinds of scripts, both Arabic and indigenous scripts that are used um, for writing uh, languages in the Philippines and the proximity of the Philippines to different paper making traditions or bark cloth making traditions in Indonesia and uh, South e mainland Southeast Asia, uh, as well as the trade with China makes it seem very odd that, that um, we have found no good evidence of, of uh, paper making uh, in the Philippines. Um, is, another question is, is paper mulberry used in North Vietnam? Yes, it is. And I'm going to combine two questions here from Kathy and Jan. Um, does handmade paper tend to have a, like a grain or an orientation? And from the plant's point of view, how are the fibers used in paper making advantageous to the plant? Ah, okay. So it depends on the way that the paper is made. Um, you can get a grain if you use the sale paper making, which I illustrated in this presentation. Um, if you are pouring uh, a solution or a slurry of water and the formation aid and the fiber onto a screen um, with the two other villages that I briefly mentioned, um, those sheets don't have a grain because you don't have this, this action of uh, by the paper maker to organize those fibers in a particular direction uh, when you tangle them together. Um, so it, it, it depends on, on the way that the sheets are formed. Um, I'm sorry, repeat the second question. Sure, uh, how are the fibers that are used in paper making advantageous to the plant? So looking at it from the plant's perspective. Yes, yeah, so th this is interesting. Um, I've read historical documents about Zaw paper making during the uh, colonial and pre-colonial era in Indochina. Um, and the descriptions by uh, French uh, colonists long ago talk about entire plantations being planted um, by the Vietnamese in North Vietnam, where you have literally thousands of different small plantations all participating in this paper-based economy. You would have tribute that would be sent to the emperor of Vietnam uh, in the form of paper. But today, when you go around, you can barely find places where the Zaw tree grows. Um, and it only has become abundant through this kind of uh, deliberate care and intent of using this and managing and growing this plant uh, for the usage of paper. And so you can really appreciate by reading historical documents and seeing what's happening today, um, this precipitous decline, not just in knowledge um, from an anthropological start point of view um, by the number of people who make this, this paper, but also in the sheer abundance of the plant in its natural environment. I have another question. So when it comes to duration, I'm not sure if they mean durability, what kind of fiber is better, zo or fiber from the mulberry family? Um, this is a hard question to answer. Um, I don't have quantitative numbers. Um, zo still hasn't been thoroughly quantified through like different paper machine testers. Um, so stay tuned. I, I hope to... to um, 
get data on that through my dissertation work. Um, I think maybe the, the better question to ask is like, you know, how do these different uh, traits or qualities or personalities uh, complement each other when appreciated uh, on this spectrum of different species that are used for paper? Um, some do in fact have better durability in the sense of sheer tensile strength. Some will fold better than others without breaking. Some will retain ink better than others. Um, some will uh, be more brittle and crack and others will be more pliable over time. Um, there's different ways of assessing paper quality. And I think just um, focusing on one, um, I mean, it depends on what you want to use the paper for, but I think focusing on one um, maybe misses the appreciation of, of different kinds of uh, ways that this paper can be used uh, species by species. Great, and I'm going to ask you our final question and I wanna thank Chelsea, our interpreter for doing an incredible job You've been getting compliments, Chelsea, by the way, so you should know that. Um, so last question to, for everyone. Uh, I would be interested in using this paper for watercolor paintings. Do you know of any artists who are currently using Zo paper I can research or help to find methods to use the paper in this type of art? Um, I bet there are people who do use this paper for watercolors. Um, uh, I would recommend you contact me through uh, email or social media, um, and I can put you in contact with my collaborator, Jung, who can better speak to that. Um, I'm not a watercolor artist, but I suspect that the absorbency of Zoll might be amenable to um, your needs. Fabulous. Uh, thank you all so much for being here, James. Thank you for an excellent talk. Um, it's always great to, I always learn more about paper each time I hear from you. Uh, and thank you everyone who stuck with us for our long Q&A. And we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks when we look at Pete in Ireland um, by Dr. West Jackson. Thank you all so very much. Have a good day.